I was the most sedentary, disconnected person from my body, less embodied that you can imagine. Trauma is not the same for everyone because the same event can be traumatic for me, but not for you. Welcome to the Mindfulness Experience Podcast. My name is Keith Fiveson. On this show, I had the pleasure of speaking with Sabina Ehrlich. She is the founder of Hatch Yoga, the author of The Art of Asana, and she's now focused on somatic coaching for individuals with trauma. Sabina is a lively, warm, and gracious lady who has deep, rich life experience. She provided me with insights into the nature of trauma and how the body's wisdom can help us to look at and reframe trauma and help us live a more abundant life now. Sabina is also a student, teacher, and coach that helps people look at their lives from a perspective and mindset that is both compassionate and wise, given her own experience in Argentina and her client experience in Canada. While our conversation was lively and fun, it was also very rich with insights, and I was very grateful for the opportunity to speak with her. I really enjoyed the conversation, and I hope you do too. Now, you and I know each other uh, for uh, less than a year, but yet I, I feel like I know you. I feel like I know you for a lifetime. I, you know, you're you're a very approachable person. You're very open. You're very honest. I mean, you are, you know, someone who really comes full heartedly into any kind of a situation and you give of yourself. And I'm just wondering uh, from, from that viewpoint, kind of how did you come to be the person you are? What kind of work you do? And how did you get into the work that you're doing? Tell me. Well, that's a long story. Mm-hmm. I um, You have time. <laughs> Not too much time, but we have time. No. Well, you know, I moved to Canada. It's going to be 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. And my background, it's, I used to be, I have a degree in computer science. So mm-hmm. that's my, you know, what mm-hmm. I used to do in my previous lifetime. Mm-hmm. And then uh, when we moved here, you I moved from, a, so you moved from where? You have a little bit of an that. accent. Where? Argentina. Argentina. Uh, Argentina. So, yeah. so I came here right. in 2001 with my husband and two of my kids who were barely babies by then. Wow. Uh, in the huge economic crisis but honestly we always wanted to leave argentina we grew up there now when you came here you had two kids right you said yes okay yeah, and you now were- have four you have four kids right now right? yes okay great okay just great got it so 21 yeah. years ago you come to canada and here you are yeah and when we landed here, I came from having a big career in IT, in mm. Buenos Aires. And the plan for me was to stay home with my kids for a mm-hmm. year, maybe until the, you know, the kids learn the language, we settle. Mm-hmm. And then plans changed and mm-hmm. I kept having kids. And mm-hmm. right. but in order in that moment to handle all the stress, honestly, moving from one country to another, especially with a young family, we sold everything we had. We never been here before. Uh, we didn't have a job, we didn't have anything. And it was the most stressful, probably time in my life. And right. I've been carrying also, I have a long history of trauma, not only mm. from my family, mm. Mm -hmm. But from the country come, right? I grew up during a military coup in Buenos Aires. Mm. And so you have, so you came here. So, like, first of all, some of the big traumatic things in life, and this is really one of the reasons why I thought it was so important to talk to you. Some of the big things in life that happen are like moving from one place to another, never mind moving itself or having children, huge change, getting married, changing jobs, doing all those things. But then, moving culturally from one culture to another culture and then coming into a a country that you've never lived in before and having to go ahead and learn all those things you went through all those things yourself and what i hear you saying is that 
you had a lot of trauma and you found that yoga was helpful. Is that true? Yes, exactly. And actually, I I came to yoga through meditation, really. Mm -hmm. And this is a funny thing. I was completely disconnected from my body. Even mm -hmm. though today I am a yoga teacher, I run marathons, I do rock climbing and all this kind of stuff where I use right. my body. Really amazing I, stuff. Mm -hmm. Until I was in my 30s, I was the most sedentary, disconnected person from my body, less mm. embodied mm. that you can imagine. Now, what does that mean, disembodied? I mean, I, I hear that term from time to time, and I hear it in relationship to trauma. And then I, I just want to understand it from a framework of, of the work that you went into, because you really have, you, you're doing somatic work, you do trauma work, you do yoga work, you really have gotten to reconfigure yourself, what does it mean to be disembodied? What does that mean? Well, when you grow up with a lot of trauma, mm -hmm. it's not safe to live in your body because it's not safe hmm. the way you feel in your body. Hmm. And somehow you learn to get disconnected from emotions, from hmm. the way you feel, and you live in your head. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a history also of an eating disorder that I carried for over 20 years of mm -hmm. my life. Mm -hmm. And I will, I could be very intellectual. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, for many, many years, I even taught yoga in a very disembodied way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so this idea of being disembodied really doesn't mean like, you know, your, your head is disconnected from your shoulders, which are disconnected from your arms. I mean, some people might look at that, that literally, but you really, from a figure of viewpoint, you're really talking about the, the mind, body, spirit, emotional connections that we have, the integrated connections, which can be, which can be cut off, which don't allow us to be fully integrated as human beings in that way. Is that right? Yes, and it's like uh, your you see your body as something you have, something you own and you carry with you, mm -hmm. and that I used to abuse for so many years, more mm -hmm. than, you know, take care of maybe, mm -hmm. and judge constantly. But even as teaching yoga, I trained teachers for years, mm -hmm. as yoga teachers, and my whole obsession, I could say, was alignment and how to be in the perfect pose and how to align, you know, muscles mm -hmm. and bones perfectly. Right. right. All the while being maybe completely disconnected from mm -hmm. introspection, from, you know, noticing what's going on in your body, how you're feeling in this moment and being fully present. Mm -hmm. Right. And I realized that many of my students practice yoga in the same way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's sort of like the machine, the machine aspect of getting the hatha, the physical aspect, the, the physical body in a perfect alignment, but then not necessarily connecting in with what is going on feeling wise, somatically, right? Is, is well, what I, I, I always prize myself of mm -hmm. being very, you know, I will teach that mm -hmm. poses are not for you to be, you know, copied or you don't have to necessarily get mm -hmm. into the perfect pose that you have to, is something to adapt to your body, to work mm -hmm. with, you know, body movement and dynamics and see what your body needs and blah, 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 blah. But it was always very disconnected mm -hmm. from sensation, especially mm -hmm. from emotion. And sometimes mm. when you're practicing, it, it can trigger a lot of things from mm. your nervous system. Mm. Mm. Right? So, you know, so, you know, that I, I, I did my yoga teacher training over at Intercal Yoga years ago. I mean, you know, totally years ago. And one of the things I remember is the whole definition of yoga is to yoke the body, the spirit, the mind, and to ego, to yoke, to, to, to break it down. So what I hear you talking about is that whole idea of getting into it is to really sort of move and be embodied, to get into your body, to really get in touch with all that. Is that, yes. is that true? 
Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. And, and what happened to me was I, like I was saying, I got into yoga through meditation, like mm -hmm. very shortly after. What kind, what kind of meditation did you do? I uh, practicing mindfulness mindfulness meditation mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. kind of the john kabat zin right right um, right right the, ba the basic mindfulness uh yeah being present with your thoughts your feelings uh, your emotions yeah. and and i realized for mm -hmm. this is the most uh the ultimate irony for mm -hmm. many many years i realized that for me it was very triggering mm -hmm. to focus on my breath mm -hmm. yeah and so that's interesting. Why? Why? I mean, is it what was it the trauma that you think uh, did it? Oh, absolutely. Hmm. And and I and I for many years I never I thought oh well maybe you know I I'm I'm, I'm this fake that I'm teaching meditation. I'm actually training teachers hmm. on how to teach meditation, and I'm mm -hmm. guy. I have my own yoga studio. I was guy right. in all of these mindfulness courses, but for me. Hmm. Staying connected to my breath was always very triggering and something very hard to do. Right. And I thought, well, I'm, you know, I'm flawed in some way, and there might be something that I'm doing mm -hmm. right. Especially when right. everyone's talking about how mindfulness is the panacea, it's the solution to everything. Exactly. Yeah. 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 But then I also started realizing when I started teaching meditation that I wasn't the only one. Mm -hmm. Right. And many of my students were mm -hmm. very triggered by connecting with their breath. And also that for many of my students, meditation wasn't something that they could do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It could actually be harmful. Mm -hmm. right. So that's a very interesting point. Let's stop there and unpack that for a moment. So, you know, uh, we start talking about trauma and I, I think you started to talk about it in terms of your experience coming from this military uh, country and, you know, from a, a, a fam family viewpoint uh, and people have trauma inside of them. Can we unpack that and really kind of talk about why do you think uh, people have a hard time uh, being mindful? and with with around trauma and you know i study trauma sensitive mindfulness and looked at all that and it's sort of like the whole break gas kind of theory that you know you need to back up you need to move forward and so on in terms of the practice but you're working with people like literally that's your work now you do a lot of work around trauma so can we unpack that a little bit and maybe uh help people to understand you know because you said you got into yoga through meditation was it because of the idea that you know it was it was challenging and the somatic work was more was more accessible or are there other ways of dealing with trauma as well as not only mindfulness and yoga work but maybe the, the kind of things you do now tell us well to be honest, I, okay, to start with, I think to answer your first question, mm -hmm. why I think it's so hard for some people who experience trauma to mm -hmm. practice meditation. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because we built, if you went through trauma, and I would define trauma mm -hmm. as anything that you experience that you didn't have the resources to deal with. Mm, okay, so so you dysregulated, you're out, you're out oh. of whack, and you're offline. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and not, trauma is not the same for everyone, mm -hmm. right? Because the same event can be traumatic for me, but not for you. Mm -hmm. So does it? So does it have to be that you're you kind of you're you're not able to deal with it? I mean, I mean, I could watch a you know somebody on TV getting stabbed, you know, uh, and you can see a lot of that stuff. Would that? be traumatic or would that be kind of you know is that implicit trauma or is that direct trauma from your view does it have to be explicit like you're offline no it depends with your own history mm -hmm. and like i was saying for example let's say you are i don't know you race cars for a living mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so you're driving your car in the middle of the highway and then your car you know, flips over, it's mm. about to flip over. And, and because this is what you do every day, you're mm -hmm. prepared for that, right? Mm -hmm. It's not that traumatic. You know what to do, you know how to get the car in control. And for you, that's not a traumatic ex experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But for mm -hmm. me, mm -hmm. 
I don't know what to do in that situation. If mm -hmm. life or death, I have no, I'm not equipped to deal with that. And that mm -hmm. same experience can be traumatic. Right. I get it. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, what you're talking about the TV has to do maybe with triggers. Mm. So when we experience something very traumatic or something that we can deal with, the hippocampus, which is the part of the brain that takes charge of creating long-term uh, long memories or right. Right. memories, goes offline. It doesn't work mm -hmm. anymore. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So we have very fractured memories mm -hmm. of traumatic experience, what we call implicit experiences, mm -hmm. that implicit memories that live in the body. Right. So implicit memories may live in the body. They might be like in a library, you might not take out the book at any particular point in time, but something happens and then all of a sudden something goes on inside of you. Yeah. Exactly. So for example, let's say you were five years old and you were in the park, right, with your mm -hmm. mom walking and it was a beautiful day and you were smelling the roses mm -hmm. and then you start hearing a dog barking and the dog comes and bites you mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you can't see your mom anymore and you're terrified and that was a very traumatic experience and you don't remember any of this right, right. but then maybe now you're in your 50s and you're walking through a park and you smell the same kind of roses mm, and you have mm -hmm. a panic attack and you don't know why mm, mm -hmm. right wow wow but what happened is everything that fired at the same time in mm -hmm. that moment, right? You sense right. of smell, your sense of hearing, your sense mm -hmm. the body sensation got wired at the same time. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what, to answer your question, maybe now you're watching TV and you're watching a shooting and maybe for you, it's completely benign. It's just, okay, this, you know, it's just, I know this is fantasy for me, right. which I know I have family members being assassinated when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. It's not something, it's extremely triggering for me. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so, got it. And when we start looking at uh, the news and we start looking at things that are happening, I mean, there's this whole idea of uh, epigenetics, the things that we inherit, things that we inherit from our family, from our parents, from our grandparents, from their grandparents. And it's sort of like markings on the DNA, right? It's a kind of a DNA profile that predisposes us to certain feelings or certain, um, you know, even a certain, based on certain events that might happen that trigger that, you know, particular event. You're saying that what I heard you say is that, you know, the dog biting you, that's pretty explicit, right? And yet at the same point, you smell the flowers that could be pretty implicit. You don't know why you might feel that way. It's like, it's not really, it's, you know, you, you, you smell the flowers, it's a trigger, but then there are things that are happening like wars, like killings, mass murderers. I mean, you know, you've got TV, the 24 hour news cycle, which is pretty traumatic and pretty triggering. Do you, do you feel that in some way, are you working with clients that in some way might be triggered by that kind of thing without really, you know, getting into the dog or getting into being, you know, killed or assassinated? Do you feel that, you know, you don't have to have explicit experiences in order to be, you know, experience trauma? Can it just happen? Oh, absolutely. I don't know if I will call it trauma necessarily it depends mm -hmm. how much can you regulate your own nervous system so big t <laughs> versus small t kind of yeah, yeah. Okay. But what's happening right now is especially now that we have so much media at the tip mm -hmm. of your fingers right mm -hmm. it's not that you put you know the eight o'clock news you can have your phone all day and be watching the news mm -hmm. and it's bombarding mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with right. and violence a lot and what that is product, producing to our nervous system mm -hmm. right okay so that's this so that's dysregulating and and what dan siegel talks about is that window of tolerance right which is you know during the course of a day we're able to regulate our nervous system yet at the same point if you have too much of one thing or another you know you can get dysregulated you can move into hypo or hyper arousal right you know, I, have, I was having this conversation with my 80 year old dad the other day mm -hmm. who has Parkinson's and dementia. He lives in Israel. And my conversation was, I was asking him, 
that please stop watching the news mm. because he's in front of a tv all day watching the news in israel about what happens there what happens you know in ukraine what happens with covid what happens with and what i was saying to him is that every he, my dad was saying you know i need to be informed but you First, in order to be informed, you know logically, you know, what happened. But every time you're looking at these images, you're hearing the new story, you're looking at this new, you know, horrific video, right, right. your nervous system gets thrown into fight or flight mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and into a fear reaction. That is normal. Mm -hmm. You need that. Right, like as a human being, if you were, you're not. It wouldn't serve you to be completely calm all the time. Mm -hmm. When we're in danger, our nervous system has to recruit every resource we have mm -hmm. to protect yourself or fly or, or mm -hmm. you know flee. Right. right. But so, the thing is, you're watching the news and you've been triggered without realizing into this sense of I'm in danger 24 mm -hmm. hours a day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did he? Did he understand that? Did he get it? Fortunately, not really. <laughs> <laughs> As 80 years old, I was going to go, yes, dad. Yes, 80 years, you know, I mean, but, but, you know, I think that's, I think that's, um, you know, mindfulness is pretty new. And a lot of people have thought that, you know, it was a little bit woo woo, but then the science comes out. And then of course, with yoga and an understanding of the mind body connection. Uh, and you got into this because of your own experience with trauma and obviously your dad uh, is, is part of that history there. So you're working with people who are in a lot of cases dealing with trauma and you you started your own business. You had this uh, thing called Hatch Yoga, right? Uh, and, and tell me, what is what was the idea behind Hatch Yoga? What a, what did that mean? Because I, 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 I really love that idea. And then you took it in a number of places and now you're taking it even further into this whole other area of trauma. Can you kind of bring us along that journey? Yes, absolutely. So like I was saying, I, I, what I got into yoga through meditation and then I did a few teacher trainings and it became like something that I really, really love to do. Mm -hmm teaching yoga and uh, at some point I found myself teach, running a teacher training for another studio mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and my dream was open my own studio and run my own teacher training and not deal with all of the things that I perceived that were right. wrong you know and you did that you did that I mean you know I, I, I did uh the problem was I had I opened a studio and honestly I, th I feel that I built a, an amazing community and you wrote a book and you wrote yeah. a book too right yeah, yeah. beautiful and and the studio, the name was Hatch Yoga because for me, Hatch is the way of, you know, coming out of the shell and I wanted the practice to mm. be transformative. Mm. Right. The problem was, first, it wasn't financial, financially viable if mm. you really want to be... Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to find the word. Uh, if you want to, you know, follow your principles, you don't want to right. get commercial, you don't yeah, want they to... call it McMindfulness. It's all the yoga studios that really don't really teach any values, but they wind up teaching you how to move your body, right? You didn't want to do that. No, and I didn't. Yeah. But I also ended up broke. So. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh. right. Well, you know. <laughs> So you can, and I, I ran my own teacher training and it was, my teacher training had extremely mm -hmm. high standards and I have so many teachers that I form and train and mentor and I'm so, they're like my kids, right? Mm -hmm. I'm so proud of them. But one of the things I didn't want to do is like there is, at least here in Canada, I know how it is in the States, is mm -hmm. this big industry of yoga teacher training. Huge. So maybe you never did yoga in your life before, right? Yeah. And you run into the studio, you walk into the studio, and they sell you that in six months right. you're going to become a teacher, uh, yoga right. teacher. If you pay, you just have to have a credit card. That's, take you, take that's your two hundred, take yeah. your two hundred hours, and there's no real lineage to it, is there? There's no real sort of 
Problem yeah. process other than going in there learning the moves. Yeah. Oh, the way I interview people, I had an intake interview for my teacher training was, you know, first, how much experience you have, why do you want to do this teacher training? And, you know, I am going to kick your ass so hard for the mm. next six months. And mm. if you want, you know, if you want to buy your certificate, mm -hmm. this is not the place I can send you to where it is. Right, right. But it's right. not with me. Mm -hmm. And that uh, to be, I know that my training was brutal, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I really feel like I found really good teachers. Right. And it was really great, but mm -hmm. I didn't have a hundred students. Right. But you, but you, but you said you anchored it on some values and principles, you know, whether or not it's the eight limbs of yoga or whether or not it's really understanding individuals and, and and understanding yoga as a way of life not necessarily as a just hatha hear the moves do the moves and you know you're done right well uh the teacher training i run i, I think i grew a lot since then mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and actually one of the reasons my yoga studio you know went bankrupt was COVID. Mm -hmm. I had no choice but to close it. And it wasn't all necessarily bad. It made me reevaluate, mm -hmm. you know, and take right. a good look at my life and take a good look of what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And in that moment of chaos, when, you know, my studio mm -hmm. was falling apart, the beginning of COVID and all the chaos, I had a really good friend who mm -hmm. used to teach for me at the studio. He taught meditation classes and we did teacher training together many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. And he was part of the CSP, the program that you and I have been taking mm -hmm. with Miles. The Contemplative Studies Program yes, with, my, exactly. with Dr. Miles Neal, who's also been on the show. Yeah, exactly. Right. My friend who was teaching mindfulness meditation started talking about my mindfulness and mm -hmm. criticizing my way of teaching right. meditation. Right. And eventually we have all of these conversations about it until eventually when I was going through a really hard time with a lot of personal things too at the beginning of COVID, he ended up convincing me to take the first course of the contemplative studies program. Got it. Which is a which is a really deep dive into Buddhist studies and the Mahayana uh, gradual path and the you know path of uh, yes. becoming becoming enlightened. Uh, not not I and I certainly I don't know about you, but I certainly haven't gotten there yet. But I'm I'm trying. <laughs> I'm not enlightened either by yeah. any means. But we're we're trying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But some, what was really mind opening about mm -hmm. this course was mm -hmm. mostly because I've been studying yoga philosophy for years. I mean, you know, I had a, a teacher who has a PhD on uh, Indian studies on uh, running the philosophy component of my teacher training. I had a lot of training in that, but what, what, what struck me was my take on trauma mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because that was what i was like oh there it is because right. i knew instinctively that there was something missing so what was that take what is trauma tell me what the what your takeaway from working with miles and now at this point because you've done not only the studies with the csp but you've also gone through a trauma uh, a teaching program and you're now you know coaching and working with clients so you've talked about it like in terms of the dog and you talked about it in terms of where you're coming from and we've talked about the body and we've talked about the mind connection and i'm wondering you know really honestly you have a client today and the client comes to you and says you know i've got trauma you know so what do you think that is and, and how do how do people deal with that? Okay, so first, when mm -hmm. you have trauma, many times you don't know that you have trauma, right? We think mm -hmm. that trauma sometimes in society, generally we think that trauma is, you know, you've been raped or you went to mm -hmm. war. Very or, explicit, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but sometimes there are, and this is what we call big T trauma. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. But there's also the love the love the mental trauma mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and trauma that has to do with uh, the kind of you know relationships we have, how we grow up as little kids mm-hmm. that can be even way more severe than mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know so in- so so mommy and daddy left the room they had to go take a pee and they left you alone that's sort of like a little tea trauma no but yet that's at the same point maybe they didn't hug you enough or they didn't love yeah, you enough. well i i am you know i'm in my 50s in my 50s i am mm-hmm. just realizing now that mm-hmm. i grew up with a mother was that was a psychopath mm-hmm. narcissistic psychopath and mm-hmm. this is and i thought all my life that there was something wrong Mm. with me Mm. and what happens is that when and this happens to a lot of people when you are growing up with that kind of trauma when Mm. you don't feel safe as a kid Mm. when you're Mm. growing up you need your parents to take feel or think that your parents can take care of you Mm -hmm. because otherwise it's terrifying you're dead right right Right. and when we can't we when we don't have that we create an the all of these brilliant mm-hmm. coping mechanisms mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. which we might dissociate ourselves mm-hmm. from the way we feel mm-hmm. so drinking drugging eating sexing spending swipe left swipe right you know all of those things are kind exactly. of coping coping mechanisms yeah yeah mm-hmm. even doing yoga even going to a yoga class right. and obsessing with alignment yeah would be mm-hmm. a coping mechanism or obsessive yeah. compulsive cleaning i mean some are more accessible you know, having your own iPhone that you're looking at and you're on social media all the time might be more acceptable than, you know, yeah. uh, drinking all the time. Is mm-hmm. that without realizing mm-hmm. even your breathing pattern mm. is trying to keep those feelings away. Your breathing pattern? What do you mean? Well, what happens is that when you have you've been through trauma sometimes the breathing pattern you have is trying to keep you from feeling certain part of the body mm. because there are certain sensations that might be very triggering for you mm. because they might go back to moments in your childhood for example in which you didn't feel safe mm. or it felt terrifying so then i'm sitting someone like that in a room and telling them okay now let's focus on your breath mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what's going to happen is all of these things that they've been trying to keep away are going to flood them. Mm, mm. So you're, so if, if you will, uh, you're kind of like in the car and the, the, the passenger seat and they're driving and they've got their hands on the wheel, right? And you're like helping them to throttle. You're helping them to hit the accelerator, hit the brake, but to really stay, hold the wheel and stay on the road without having to kind of abandon the vehicle, right? Because within the construct of what you're talking about, you're really like a, a, a trauma, a trauma, you're, you're, you're helping people to drive through or go through their trauma or experience it in a way that allows them to be present to what is going on for them, yeah? So feel it in the body, be present to it. I really like to look at trauma and yoga Actually, mm-hmm. I recently took a training on polyvagal yoga mm. through the lenses of the polyvagal nervous system. Right. So the polyvagus nerve, the 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 vagus nerve, and really understanding the whole nervous system, which is a whole other. We can we could probably take a whole show with that, right? Yes, but to make it really quick, the idea yeah. is that your nervous system basically can be in three different states Mm -hmm. and there's a hierarchy of that in that right so you could be ideally we want to be in a state which we call ventral in which is you know the state when you are sometimes and we all experience that mostly Mm -hmm. when we are you know present and feeling playful or wanting Mm -hmm. to connect with someone because we're having a great time or you're enjoying the moment or you're that's when your social engagement system is connected Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then at some points because 
life is like that, we might go through danger in life, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. you're about to cross the street and a car is coming towards you and you are afraid you're going to get hit. So mm -hmm. your nervous system goes into fight or flight, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I need right. to protect myself. And that's okay. That's healthy. The problem is that sometimes then we don't get to come back to this right. central state. Right. Into that then, window of tolerance. Yeah. Exactly. And then sometimes what happens is we've been too much mm -hmm. in that state of mm -hmm. fight or flight where the body says, I had enough. Mm. So we begin to dissociate and go into a dorsal state. Mm -hmm. We all oscillate in between these three states. Mm -hmm. The problem is how do we regulate them? Got it. Right. So, so you're teaching the skills. You're helping people the skill to breathe, to be present, to be embodied, to go ahead yeah, and connect in. But oh, I, right. I, I like to look at trauma from that point of view because it gets depathologized too. A lot of things that you might think, oh, why do I do this? That is so weird. Mm -hmm. I am so, you know, I might be so sick. Mm -hmm. Well, it makes a lot of sense for your nervous system. You're not weird. Right? Got it. Got it. Yoga can help you a lot with that. And when you're doing mindfulness and you're doing meditation, mm -hmm. you are trying to access these states of, you, you're trying to learn to regulate mm -hmm. and you need to go to the past in order to move forward. You need mm -hmm. to go to the place of, of trauma. But what, there is this phrase that I really like that it says, you know, uh, healing happens when you touch with love what you previously touched with fear healing happens when you touch with love what you previously touched with fear that's beautiful exactly. yeah that's beautiful and but we have to go very slowly mm -hmm. right and in Don't. a safe way so if i throw you and if you have a lot of trauma and i throw you in a 40 minute you know meditation practice focusing mm -hmm. on your breath mm -hmm. i am throwing you out there with your trauma mm -hmm. out of your window of tolerance you won't be able to come back there Got it. oh well that's so it's very important from a coaching perspective from a practice viewpoint that you do this i guess in a gradual way right so i'm yeah. I'm, I'm aware that we've got uh, you know, just a couple of minutes, uh, and from a timing viewpoint, I'm just wondering, uh, what would you recommend for folks that are really wanting to dive into this whole area of trauma? Obviously, to work with you uh, is one thing. Uh, I love your contact information, but how can people kind of sort of start on the road to healing? Um, do you have any recommendations that you might be able to give them? Uh, well, it depends the level of trauma we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think it's really well, it's really important because most often than not, trauma is relational. Mm -hmm. It has to do with relationships we have or the lack of connections we have and we need it. Mm -hmm. So you will need other people in your life to heal trauma, people who can help you to co-regulate, people who can lend you their nervous system. Mm -hmm for mm -hmm. you to go into those places that are so scary mm -hmm. and not necessarily has to always be a therapist mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but if you're dealing with serious trauma i think you sh will highly benefit from it so working with a therapist and 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 then you know can this be done uh you know via zoom or via Someone in, uh, by, or I mean, can you do it via videos or, you know, how, uh, how? I, I do work with clients on Zoom. Mm -hmm. You do. Okay. I do. I, my own therapist. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> therapy right. Through Zoom. Right. I don't really like, ideally, a woman, but to be honest with you, I, you know, I'm recently, for example, I'm looking for a therapist for my daughter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm rather find someone that I really find very competent and is trained how I want to, mm -hmm. even if it is through Zoom that someone in person who might not have mm -hmm. the skills I need. Mm. So you you certainly have uh, a perspective in terms of what makes someone competent and capable and a match. So if people wanted to get a hold of you, would they be able to kind of, if they wanted more information, would they be able to reach out to you and kind of get a hold of you to 
kind of asked you some questions. Would you be open to that? Absolutely. Yeah. You can go to my website. It's www.hatchyoga.com. Mm-hmm. Okay. Or you can email me at sabina at hatchyoga.com. <laughs> Sabina at hatchyoga.com. Yeah, okay. yeah, and in my website, there is all the coordinate information and people contact me like that all the time. So, yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Okay, good. Because so, so this is a very deep conversation and I, I, I know it's a conversation. I wanted to have you on the show because I know you are very uh, wise about this. You've got a lot of experience, not only personal experience, but professional experience in working with people. You're really um, someone who I respect as a healer. That's someone who has healed themselves and has the capability and the wisdom and the insight to go ahead and help other people to heal themselves as well. So um, I really want to thank you very much for taking the time to be on the show, Sabina. Uh, And it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being a part of the Mindfulness Experience podcast. I hope you enjoyed this frank and honest discussion with Sabina Ehrlich. I also hope that you gained some valuable insights on how trauma and mindfulness can work together to help us to reframe our own experiences and deal with our day-to-day lives. Please follow the podcast to connect for future ones as well. Subscribe, leave us a review, and suggest topics that you'd like to hear. Connect with us on our social media platforms or visit our website at workmindfulness.com for more mindfulness experiences. Thank you again. See you on the next show. Take care.